moderator today is Dr. Patty Slatum, Professor Emeritus at Virginia Commonwealth University and co-director of the Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program at the Virginia Center on Aging and a visiting scholar at GSA. GSA's grant chats are a series of one hour virtual sessions designed to bolster a broad range of grantsmanship skills, specifically tailored to your work as a gerontologist researcher. Today's grant chat explores strategies for funding community engaged research and was developed by GSA community engaged research interest group. Are you conducting community engaged research in aging or considering it? How do you communicate with funding agencies about your work? How do you demonstrate authentic partnerships with communities in your grant application? What sources of funding are available to support community-engaged research? We will delve into these questions and more. The session is an opportunity to learn from each other, expand your network, and share resources. Before we begin today's program, I would like to provide a few logistical considerations. Please introduce yourself in the chat. Use the chat box throughout the presentation to comment or ask questions. Please keep your audio muted until it's time for discussion. This grant chat is being recorded and will be available after the event on the GSA website. To open today's grant chat, I would like to introduce our panelists. We are delighted to have a distinguished group of GSA members with us to share their experiences seeking funding to support their community engaged research. Our panelists have experience writing successful applications and working with a variety of funders. First, we welcome Dr. Thomas Cujo, Robert and Jane Meyerhoff, Endowed Assistant Professor of Medicine, Johns Hopkins University. Next, we welcome Dr. Carrie Leach, Research Assistant Professor, Institute of Gerontology, Community Engagement Director, Center for Urban Responses to Environmental Stressors, Cures, Associate Center Director of Community Inclusion, Center for Health Equity and Community Knowledge in Urban Populations, Checkup, Wayne State University. Next, we welcome Dr. Lana Sargent, Associate Dean for Practice and Community Engagement, Associate Professor, School of Nursing, Core Faculty, Institute for Inclusion, Inquiry and Innovation, iCubed, Aging Health and Wellness, Transdisciplinary Core, Virginia Commonwealth University. We look forward to an engaging and enlightening conversation. And Jason, you could stop sharing the slides so that we could see the panelists' um, faces more clearly. And we'll begin our panel discussion. We have questions that we'll begin with, and we'll also be monitoring the chat to um, call on some audience members' questions as well. So first, these are questions that our interest group has generated ahead of time. Could the panelists please briefly describe your community-engaged research program and how it is funded? And we could start um, with whoever would like to take the floor. Yeah, I can start. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Thomas Cujo, as she said, I'm at Baltimore at Johns Hopkins University, uh, and I'm a geriatrician. Clinically, I do house calls, uh, seeing older adults in their homes in the community and have a program of research that focuses on the social connections of older adults, specifically older adults who live in subsidized housing communities. And so um, I've been fortunate to have funding uh, from uh, foundation funding, uh, as well as uh, NIH support as well as some philanthropic support um, and I would say that uh, uh, the funding has uh, been gradual and increased over time um, uh, but that's the core of uh, what my program of research focuses on and I can go into more details as the conversation progresses. Thanks Lana. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Cujo. Uh, so my name, it looks like um, Patty got back in here, just wanted to mention. Um, my name is uh, Carrie Leach. My sources of funding um, uh, have a few different uh, streams. So first and foremost, my uh, work has started through funding through the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, NIEHS, which is um, under the umbrella of NIH. And what I do there is help drive the environmental health science with input from a community advisory board. So on the spectrum of community engagement, I've worked at all kind of um, all kind of streams across a continuum of community engagement. I'm also re uh, just received funding that started April 1st uh, uh, this year through uh, PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and that is a 
um, community engagement capacity building award. And the goal of that project is to um, help Detroit older adults identify their own research questions um, that we might be able then to then uh, pursue together. So um, I'll stop there with just, um, I'll be focusing on the NIHS role and then the PCORI grant. Mana? Oh, sure, that's wonderful. It's so great to hear. Um, so I'm, um, I think some key things to know about uh, where I do my work is um, I'm at VCU, but I also do much of my community gauge work in a program called the Richmond Health and Wellness Program, which took about 10 years to build. And we provide um, care coordinated services through a interdisciplinary teaching model where students are working with older adults in Section 8 housing units and out in the community um, and it's, um, in our centers in which they are coordinating care. And then we built a research model uh, that's integrated in with that service model. And then I also am uh, a nurse practitioner and I have a clinical practice at our uh, VCU Health Center. Um, and so that's uh, often where I engage also in not only care and service, but uh, research. Um, my program of research is really uh, focused on community older adults, low-income older adults, and uh, preventing risks um, for uh, cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's related dementias. Um, so early detection, everything from biomarker work, um, we are doing some genomic work in the community and I can talk about um, how we're doing some of that work as well as become a very interesting arm of our work and getting people to uh, have uh, research literacy around really complex topics has become an arm of our work um, and really important. Um, my Research funding has come slow. Uh, started off as small pilot grants uh, internally and externally, um, as well as um, I just recently got an R01 funded with a colleague. And I have also had um, an ACL, so the Administration for Community Living funding, uh, which uh, has really helped push forward on programmatic um, uh, uh, things that actually often research won't fund. And I heard that was uh, talked about previously and um, before we got on this call um, with that just sustains programs that also help support research. Um, so I'll stop there and happy to talk more. Great. What a fantastic variety of topics and funding streams that you all can talk about. Um, for the next question, I'm wondering, maybe we could just go in the same order. Um, how do you tell your community engaged story in your grant application? And how do you demonstrate that authentic partnership when you're writing your grants? You broke up for me a little bit, but I, I think I I garnered the question. I think it may have been, I'm sorry. It may have been so my How do you tell your story and um, how do you show that genuine partnership? Yeah, so I, I would say that, um, like in my introductory remarks, I, like I didn't share a whole lot, but uh, I think the key to authenticity in grants is actually, or has been for me, has been not like coming up with the research problem myself, but hearing that problem uh, from uh, the community. And so that's how my research uh, journey began. Um, it began uh, engage, having an interest in wanting to engage older adults in the community, meeting them where they are, and hearing from them directly what uh, were the things that were concerning them. And so, um, uh, and so it, for me, it's been um, somewhat easy to authentically share that and, and pursue questions related to that, because the questions are coming from the community, the, the issues are coming from the community. And so, uh that uh, my my first funding uh was from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and it was a actually a leadership program that had some couple funding uh to do a strategic initiative as they called it and my strategic initiative was focused on engaging uh older adults and leaders who are working in that space um uh in uh things that they saw as uh challenges and opportunities in the setting so you know there's challenges but then there's also like things that where there's assets and opportunities. And so when I write about these things in grants, um, I bring in vignettes from uh, these things. I, I, you know, and I, I talk about, you know, some of the um, concerns like actually uh, uh, that people have stated in some of these encounters that I uh, into the grant. But I would say generally um, for NIH funding mechanisms, I 
I take a, a standard form in terms of talking about what, you know what the problem is as it's understood, and then weave in uh, you know the things that I've heard specifically from um, people in the community who may be navigating the problem or may have navigated and have been successful um, in, in, in dealing with whatever the issue might be. Yeah, um, to follow that, I have a feeling we're going to say uh, some of the same things um, in different ways. But yeah, um, I, I have to agree with what Dr. Cujo said. You know, the um, origination of the problem that I'm talking about starts um, with the inclusion of the voices of people that I'm representing in that um, grant application. Obviously, um, letters of support that um, as a part of that demonstrates it. So not just what I'm saying, but also pointing to those to exemplify what I'm saying or support what I'm saying. Um, but most of the projects that I have pursued in partnership have come out of a lot of sessions of meeting and dialogue. Um, even last night, I had a three hour Zoom with uh, Adele, who's an 80 year old that I've worked with for nine years. And to say, we're starting a new grant, let me jog your memory what we talked about in 2021 and 2022, right? Because it was a long time ago that we talked about this and um, worked on the project together. So then revisiting the conversation and, and going through the process of refreshing our memory, what we proposed we were going to do and said we were going to do together. So just a, a lot of dialogue and listening. And actually, um, in my most recent um, NIHS uh, uh Part of that P30 grant, I actually had call outs with the names of individuals that made comments um, that were um, reflective of those voices. So it's not just me saying it, but so that you can actually hear um, in the words of um, my community stakeholders, participants, partners, um, so that those um, experiences are there in their own words and not just me restating them. Um, so I'll pass it to you, Lana. Yeah, I, I agree, Karen. We're all going to say a lot of the same things. So I'm going to add some things on that we've done uh, to everything that you've said. So, you know, sh sharing, certainly having letters of support. We've also, I know, and I know that you guys do it too, but have an advisory board um, with your community state research. So we show, we often show how our advisory board works in the grant and how we communicate with them and how the flow of ideas move, like Dr. Cujo said, um, from them to us and back again. Um, we also, in several of our works, we've really worked hard to try to translate the results back to individuals so we'll show them what we've given back in the past um, in the grant. So if we gave a card of results or something like that, then we'll put it in the next one. Um, so that, those are two big things. And then the other thing is uh, any work you've done around showing that authentic partnership that has been published is also a great piece to put in your grant. So, um, you know, we had we had a, a paper that we did on our team and how our team works and how our team engages with the community. And we often cite that work, you know, in our grants to show we've done all this. You can take and go ahead and look at the publication, right, for all the work we did. And it shows that basis. Uh, we just recently finished a qualitative study in which we asked participants why they work with us. What's the reason they engage with us? Uh, and what do they really know about the work that we're doing with them? And that's going to be a, a paper that we're going to cite probably pretty frequently about what work we're doing. So sh showing the publications that you're doing and how you create that authentic relationship is also really powerful. Um, and then I think we have another member of our team who just who recently did one on uh, not so much on how the individuals um, that were that are in our studies perceive our work how we as researchers organize ourselves uh, to um, to engage and we publish that work too. So any, I think also not just showing what it, but any published work that you've done and that you can cite in your grant work also kind of helps tell the story. So that's all I can add to it, to the conversation. I was gonna add one more thing. I think uh, what Carrie and Lana have kind of shared is that this is not something that you, you build overnight. Um, it's something that you kind of, develop over time and um, and you know you're you know we're committed as uh, you know researchers and when we show that we're committed we build trust in those uh, in, the, in the communities that we're working in and I think that comes out uh, when you're able to reference 
you know, five years ago or four years, whatever it might, however, potentially longer. Um, I think Lana and her remarks previously said 10 years. Uh, and so like, I think, you know, when you, you work in communities uh, um, you know, people will be able to state those things in letters of support about how long you're in. I think, I, you know, I want to believe that that, uh, that leads to better products and I believe the success in these grants. Thank yeah, you I all. Think, yeah, these are like really great um, points. And I, I do think being able to show it, and I see that Harriet has also added in our chat, you know, even those relationships being maintained during things like pandemics so that you can demonstrate that they are sustained. Um, and it does come through letters of supports, but these other mechanisms too. And I think the work that Lana and I have done it was straight out from an, a town hall meeting at the very beginning. You can point back to it happening from the very inception of the project, right? And that is just, um, I think, more convincing in the grant application. And while we're uh, on this note, uh, our next uh, topic is really about the sources of funding. And you all have talked a little bit about how your current work is funded. But um, what other thoughts do you have about these sources of funding that are available to support community engaged projects, especially those coming from the community? And we can start with, how about we go the other way this time? How about we start with Carrie? <laughs> Um, and just so you know, Patty, I asked Jason Baker, who's our GSA um, support, to spotlight you since you're also co-facilitating. So oh. if everybody's wondering why Patty's in the audience, she <laughs> did a lot to help us set this up today. So um, just to know. Um, so uh, now I've lost my train of thought. What is uh, other sources of funding? Was that the oh, question? I'm sorry, Patty. Just sources of funding that are available, that you're aware of, that you've found to be successful for these kinds of projects, especially the ones coming from the community, right? Yeah. So um, I wanted to point, I'm going to answer that question and then also point back to somebody's question because we had a peer mentoring session before this. And I, I think that's where I want to like dig in here. Um, that I don't think I can solve all of the problems that one of my community members might have, right? And so even if it's not resources through funding, I feel like I walk a line between connecting community stakeholders, informants, whatever you want to call them, grass tops, grassroots at lots of levels um, to help foster community inreach so that they can leverage the resources that are available across Wayne State University to their benefit. That's really um, because some of the questions that come up in our collaborations aren't necessarily best suited for someone like me, right? And so there was someone that was talking in our peer mentoring session about a question that would come up or that a community partner wanted to continue working on a project. And one of the things I do is talk about their needs and then connect them with other departments or existing resources at Wayne State University in my university and actually appointed them elsewhere to other universities because we're not the only one doing it um, so that they can leverage those resources. So I don't necessarily think I'm here to solve all those problems. Now, when there is a direct connection, right, my background is in health communication. I work with environmental health um, research and scientists and, uh, and, uh, and gerontology and gerontologists. Um, and so when it makes sense for me to easily connect with individuals, um, I've worked on projects um, and uh, related, um, I'm thinking of the, um, RRF, now I can't remember the retire, research retirement fund. Is that right? Foundation fund. Um, yeah, Lana and Tom and, and everyone's giving me a thumbs up. Uh, so RRF, uh, Robert J. Wood Foundation is another um, source that I'm familiar with. So I'm going to stop there because now I've talked too much. But just to, I just wanted to mention when I don't, I'm not raising the funds myself, um, uh, punting and connecting and making connections with people so that they can then pursue those questions together. Hopefully I've built their capacity and skills and they know how to vet those things going forward. Um, but I also consider myself a connector or a liaison between, um, you know, to foster that university and reach on behalf of the people that I collaborate with. 
Yeah, I can jump yeah, in. I'll, I'll add yeah. to that too. Sometimes the timing, right, is not immediate. So we may not be able to meet all needs immediately as they're asked. I just had this beautiful opportunity this past um, semester, a tribal community around us had asked for some help around cancer in their, in their community. And I'm not a cancer researcher. I wasn't in a position. I tried connecting, it didn't work. Well, then we got new people in our cancer center and all of a sudden the project is happening. It took, it took time. So don't feel like it's only now or not. These things are taking time. And so don't, it's important to remember. And I'll let you go ahead, Dr. Cujo. Yeah, no, I, I just, you know, echo um, Harry's points and also kind of say, so that, like I mentioned, I've had funding from the Robert Johnson Foundation, but uh, and I've also had funding from the uh, AARP Foundation and, and then NIH. Um, and so I do think that there is increasingly interest in funding community engaged research and almost like not only interest, but like some level of expectation uh, that people are engaging at. You know, I, I, um, I always, particularly with federal grants, I always tell people these are taxpayers' dollars. Like if we're not doing work that engages them, like you know, what are what are we doing? I, um, so you know, I think that um, uh, there, I wouldn't be discouraged or, or, or you know about you know seeking uh, NIH funding for projects that are community engaged. I would say that. Sometimes it's important to make sure that the questions are clear, how you're going to engage the community, and that they and acknowledge that there may be parts of the work that NIH is not interested, but you know are important for the community that you are going to do anyway. But um, but you know specifically the things that they're funding, uh, you're going to answer those questions as well. So I, I would say that look at um, you know the funders and and see. The funding as an opportunity to do what you hope to do and what you promised the funder to do, but also the other things that you know are important for the community. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, because um, uh, uh, you know, and so that's what I would say um, about that. There are resources out there, and and many of our institutions, uh, a lot of these large uh, academic centers. I also have uh, philanthropists who give resources as well from time to time. And so, um, you know, talking with development offices uh, and uh, and hearing from them about, you know, what are there funders who are local or where uh, or maybe elsewhere that are, are willing to fund initiatives to sustain them? Because, you know, you guys put me in the magazine talking about that. I'm a good, you know, you know, these institutional magazines about the good work that the research is doing. Uh, and so, hey, this is the opportunity to, to sustain some of the work. I think also uh, being thoughtful and creative about um, where funding will come from in the future. Like I've had colleagues, I'm, I haven't, I'm not there yet, but who their uh, interventions that they've developed have spun off into nonprofits. Um, and so that's uh, been a way that uh, some colleagues have uh, thought about uh, ongoing funding of work. Uh, I think examples of this on a broad scale um, is the Experience Corps that AARP uh, runs now. So that was a that came out of research here in Baltimore, where uh, you know older adults were doing tutoring in schools. That was work led by Linda Freed um, and colleagues, um, and so that you know now it's a, a national model. Uh, other colleagues, um, uh, colleague Carrie Neiman. Uh, initiated this effort uh, to increase hearing access. Um, so uh, um, over-the-counter hearing uh, supports uh, in, uh, for low-income uh, uh, individuals to improve their ability to engage. And so I know that spun off into um, uh, an, a nonprofit. And so uh, part of uh, her and her group's work was to be advocating at on the policy level to get uh, better funding supports for older adults. So I think I'm saying all this to say that there's a variety of directions that can be leveraged uh, to fund uh, work uh, uh, and to think about the work and, uh, you know, you do the research, but also being thoughtful about, you know, how you're going to sustain, um, uh, sustain the outputs.
someone just put in the chat about CVS funding. I was, I can, I completely agree with everything that's already been said. I love Dr. Cujo's point about um, grantsmanship. <laughs> Um, NIH definitely is interested, but uh, you can achieve a lot by the way you address the questions and the way you form it and then what you do with that when you implement it. So I, I agree, I don't be shy about, I think there's a lot of support at NIH. Um, and then I would say, uh, the only thing I would add to, I mean, there's all kinds of funding streams, foundation, uh, we actually got our first service program, Patty and myself and our other, a uh, colleague who's running the Richmond Health and Wellness Program from HRSA, which is the Health Resources and Service Administration off of a teaching initiative. And our second one is also off of teaching. So I uh, just stretching your mind to think about different ways. Uh, I know there was a conversation earlier before we got into this panel about like, how do you sustain programs? And the sustainability often comes in weird ways. It doesn't come in traditional research. And often the sustainability of the program comes first and then the research comes like built into that. Um, the other thing I would say that just hasn't been brought up is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. I think Carrie also brought that up as like sometimes we're not the one to answer the question, but another discipline um, can have sometimes access to grants or resources that otherwise maybe myself as a nurse might not fit in but I can still collaborate with them and we can still find a way to do the project. So that has happened a lot where we'll be collaborating on a specific topic and we'll all change leads. Like you take this one, I'll take this one. Um, so we have had um, some colleagues be really successful at reaching out to other centers that have, that have P30s uh, and they've been able to get some small grant funding to run a pilot uh, with us, and that was through pharmacy. I'm not a pharmacist, but I got to get some of my work tied to that, uh, right? And we were able to actually model together pieces of our funding to fund something much bigger in a bigger project um, by addressing lots of little questions within a bigger project. So um, you can do it that way too. Collaboration is, is great. Uh, and that is a, also a wonderful way to tap into some other funding that might not be available to you in your own discipline. Thank you all. I'm too busy taking notes here to uh, <laughs> move on to my next question. Um, I'd like to ask you what tips and pearls you can share for how to successfully secure funding for community engaged research, anything you haven't covered so far. So examples, you know, maybe how you involved those community stakeholders that you've talked about in the development of your research or your strategies for starting effective partnerships, what really makes these partnerships um, good partnerships or anything else you'd like to add, um, you know, recruitment strategies, things like that. Uh, and Lana, maybe you want to start again. Sure, I can, I can take it. Uh, I'm going to give some examples of what some of my colleagues have done. Um, so we have a postdoc who um, was working with us who's now recently moved over to the Center on Aging. And um, in her work, she's working on substance use disorders. She's working on one of our projects, but she's done something really cool in her work um, where she's, um, with her substance use, she's actually getting participants who are interested in becoming coaches, right, Kathy? If I'm, I mean, uh, Patty, am I saying that right? They're, they're going through programs. She's getting them engaged in programs that help build her work um, and help kind of feed back into her work. Um, so peer that, and then their peer yeah. support, yeah, they're peer, yeah. So that one of her participants actually is going to become a peer support specialist um, for her substance use uh, uh, research that she's building. Um, and that's what she wants to actually look at is those peer support um, interventionists um, and, you know, how, how it can be effective. So getting them involved in the research, getting them trained, and then sometimes they become, I'm sure many of you guys have examples of this, where they actually become partners in the research. Um, and then we have individuals, a part of the um, advisory board who become advocates for the work. They're participants, but they also go out and advocate for that and spread the word. Um, so I think that those are some great ways in which we've seen people get engaged um, in in the work. Um, yeah, I think I think that those are the, the two big ones I can think of right now. 
in which participants actually become a part of the research um, or a part of the narrative um, themselves. I just want to make sure I understand you say so the questions about recruitment strategies for community engaged research. It was a broad question that you can take however yeah. you'd like to <laughs> yeah. um, kind of uh, just kind of extra pearls we haven't touched on yet. Yeah, so Lana took on recruitment um, as far as I think I took uh, on engagement. How like happen. how do we? Yeah, not necessarily. Yeah. I think I took more how you engagement. Right, how right, right. How you involve in your community stakeholders yeah. and the There's development all... of the research. Yes. Yeah. But engagement, I mean, a recruitment is a big one too. So if Dr. Cujo wants to take that, that would be huge. Yeah. yeah recruitment no, and just really fostering those good partnerships. So wherever you want to take that big question. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's kind of been mentioned before. You know, I think making it easy for people to be engaged uh, and ensuring that they don't just feel like they're engaged, but they are engaged in the process. And I, I know people talk, oh, we want people to feel like they know we want people to really be uh, engaged in the process. So this is, you know, um, in the process of conceptualizing ideas, having that bi-directional engagement uh, where people are able to further hone it. And then, you know, when the projects are funding, funded, letting them know that it was funded and, you know, the ongoing plan to engage them and, you know, what are the survey tools that we're going to do and, you know, creating space for them to get feedback. Does this work? I mean, I think that, some of that, if you have a trusted group of people who you're able to work with um, on an ongoing basis, then when you're actually, you know, there and collecting data, you know, that process is, can be easier um, because you've kind of got to entrust their voices, uh, perspectives, you know, early on. And so, um, and, and as it comes to recruitment, I think uh, the people will tell you, you know, where you can find people to, you know, who will be successful at actually recruit the, the study. So, um, you know, I think that that's the kind of model that I've seen uh, be successful and that I'm employing in my own work is, um, is like having that <laughs> being present, not only when research is going on, uh, but being present um, and available, you know, throughout uh, time and not just when you have funding to do a project. And so I know that's not e always easy to do, but I mean, I do think that, um, positioning uh, yourself in the community where you're seen as a, you know, not only as a researcher, but an advocate for some of these challenges that people face. Yeah, I, uh, to different, I mean, I so agree and uh, hear everything that Lana and Thomas saying, like in my bones, it is calcified. I couldn't agree more. I guess what I would add is, um, if I had pearls of wisdom, one of the things that I, when I'm like talking to researchers that maybe are interested in partnering with organizations, and we talked a little bit about this in the meeting just before this, our peer networking, which is um, why do you want to partner and what are you hoping to get out of that partnership? And also what are you hoping to offer as a benefit um, through that partnership? Um, I think thinking through those things, because I hear people that ask me at least, well, I want to be sure that I disseminate this information in an effective way. There are paths for that to happen, and maybe you have an office of community engagement in your university, or there are other resources. There just are a lot of resources within universities that I often see people not leveraging um, to their own benefit or to help um, solve some of those problems. Um, and also, uh, one of the most effective things that I've done over the last year and hearing um, from some of my closest partners is when we're having meetings, actually handing the mic to somebody and letting them lead. And actually, um, because their voice as the driver, they're, they have skins in the game, they're more involved in creating the agenda, they are just sharing the mic and handing it is an expression of value for the person, the partnership, and having representation from community, um, I think is really important. Obviously, I am a, a white female and I work, all my work is in Detroit. And if you don't know about Detroit, it's 80% um, African American. Um, it's very diverse. And so having people that are part of the community lead any of our community meetings is a really important um, 
um, approach for me. And um, it was only in the last year that one of my partners actually suggested that. And it's really made a big difference in the way that people even interact and, 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 and participate a lot more um, in town halls or, or different situations. So I guess my pearl of wisdom is um, listen and share leadership um, and then finally prepare to be surprised. <laughs> um, yeah, not to scare anybody, but it's just well, hard. And remembering that there's often a history with these um, potential partners that came long before you but they may be with others at the institution or they're seen as the institution. I mean, I remember the first town hall meeting we had about the Richmond Health and Wellness. Actually, people said, if you're going to just come here, take what you need and go, we're not interested. That means they'd experienced that before, right? <laughs> or it's how they were used to experiencing it. So often we're involved in a culture change too of just how um, engagement can happen. So it is a, a nice back and forth um, and do what we say we're gonna do and don't make commitments. There's no way we can keep and help to um, form this over time. And I think it does take time, but it's well worth it to if you need to build something that's gonna be sustainable. Um. I'd like to add on to that question and just ask how, if you all can share examples or um, times that you've encountered, um, how you've navigated conversations about roles of community members, compensation, budget, and involve them in those types of decisions, maybe things you've learned the hard way or, or just um, kind of that tricky situation. I can start. Um, you know, I think um, you kind of brought it out in your question comment. Uh, you know, you have to compensate people for their time, and so in in acknowledging that, you know, they are experts in, in their own right, just like you know, uh, we are experts in our own right. And so, you know, I, I think always seeing that when you're working with, uh, you know, community partners, that you will respect and compensate them for their time is an important thing to be incorporated in the grant. So like, uh, like, so in the budgets, uh, for the grants, I mean, I think, it, uh, at, uh, coming up with a strategy to account for that is so, so important. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I think that's the, one of the key, um, key things. And I think that when you do that, um, people understand that you're taking their time seriously and will contribute to it in a different way. When, whereas if you don't, I think you can feel like, hey, you, you've incorporated, if they understand how it works, you've incorporated time, uh, you know, resources for your time, but uh, for no one else. And so I, I think um, that's so, so important. And I think it, it can be, it can be challenging to do um, uh, and sometimes understanding that, you know, their resources are distributed in different ways. And uh, and so I think sometimes kind of figuring out if there's, you know, other pots of resources that you can, you know, lump on to uh, the resources that you have in some of the grants, uh, I think is also an approach. So I, I know there's, you know, fortunate to have non-sponsored funds to kind of, you know, offset and buffer uh, some of the projects. So, and, and you know, I mean, I think it may be part of, a broader conversation that we need to have is how can we be advocates uh, that we can get supplemental budgets to do some of these things, um, uh, considering that we know that it um, it involves community and um, and sometimes you know resources aren't sufficient that are provided from some of the funders. Yeah, if I could just piggyback on what you just said, um, and having those conversations up front before the grant is submitted, right, and compensation and thinking about equity and that and having people that are going to be partners review and see and understand and you have a good explanation for how you came up with the dollar more amount. I use a PCORI, um, there's a compensation framework link I can provide, which um, we use to guide all of our um, uh, budgets that we co-develop. Um, and even last night when I met with one of my community partners saying, I know you looked at this a year and a half ago when we submitted this, but reworking and talking through all of the budget, how we came up with the um, hourly level of compensation for, for the effort throughout the grant and just being very transparent, open and, uh, and 
very transparent and communicate about those issues up front is also, yeah, really important just to add to what Tom was saying. Yeah, I agree. Both of those. Um, we had to establish within our team because we were all working in the same community um, what that rate was going to be. Um, because if someone went off and did a grant and the rate was much different, then there was really a, a, an equity issue and a disparity issue amongst the grants. So I think it is important, especially if you're all working together in the same community to establish that early. Um, so I think that's a really good point. And I like Carrie that you gave a an evidence-based resource that you can actually link to, that would be really useful to have. Um, yeah, I think that the other thing is um, that we've alluded to here, um, but maybe even bringing out and making it more intentional is that when you're working, I think when we were working in the community um, and like, like Patty said, when we go out in the community, they, they wanna know that we're fully present. Um, and that means that we do address things that sometimes are completely not related to the work we're doing. Their phone's broken or they don't know how to use their phone. I'm gonna spend some time helping them figure out how to fix their phone. Or, you know, their oxygen machine's broken. I spent hours trying to fix an oxygen machine uh, that, you know, someone came down and it wasn't working right. Um, and, or they need glasses or hearing aids. We do it, right? And and the Carrie had said earlier, you know, sometimes we're not the one to have the expertise, but sometimes we gotta reach out and navigate that care or navigate that effort. Um, and that is actually, and we just, like I mentioned earlier, we finished a qualitative study to figure out why people engage with us, especially around big topics like genomic research and community. And that was the reason, one of the number one reasons that came out of that was that because you give and you, you help us is the reason we give back. Um, and so I often find, and in that study, we found that the compensation, although it was helpful, it wasn't the main driver for them participating with us. It was, uh, as Thomas had said earlier, the trust and what Carrie had said previously about helping when it didn't seem like it fit within your box. It was completely outside of your box. Um, that we're in the community, we're in there with them, uh, trying to help them out. And sometimes that means that um, we have to, we're doing things that don't always relate to our research, right? Uh, when we're there. So I think those are the two things that we've seen come up quite frequently um, that help. Oh, I can add. That's uh, fantastic. Have you all had any, um, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about means of and the importance of disseminating your findings into the community and how it actually gets translated into improvement in the circumstances that your whole research was designed to address? Uh, so I will start. I want to just also add to something that Lana said earlier, and since we're talking about dissemination, which is um, while it was not in an RFA, one of the reviewers that gave feedback on one of our grants um, a reference list was cut off. And so now in my bio sketch, I actually like highlight co-authored publications with community stakeholders. Um, I've been criticized for that, even though that was not a requirement, but it's um, looks like, you know, it's a practice that I use, even if it's a co-presentation in community or at a conference in an academic setting, not everybody values um, academic settings nor want to contribute. And um, so, but uh, one of the projects I'll refer to, um, which was uh, very much a CBPR project that I work with with older adults. Um, I started that project. I've made a lot of mistakes over the last 15 years working in community age research. So I'm gonna be very honest about how I started this project poorly, which was, I was really interested in um, working with a county. We had conducted a needs assessment there and, and, knew, and there were some questions that were very obvious that we could follow up to um, and, and pursue those questions together. I had a particular interest in rural aging and they said, well, this county is 38% rural. And so that wouldn't actually resonate with our commission on aging. And so if we go to policymakers or people that will implement these um, uh, recommendations or results, they're only gonna land on some of the people. And what we need to do is make sure that this research is uh, reaching all of the nine K 
uh, voting districts. And so that is making adjustments to say, how can this lead to action and what uh, will the uptake be? And how will my decision and inf uh, uh, decision making influence that, right? So if I had no partners and I, and I pursued that path, that research would not have been actionable because it's not relevant, right, to the policymakers. And so um, that was a real learning lesson for me to say, it doesn't matter what I want to research, right? Um, and, and lead with listening and set, you know, knowing who, where the levers are and, and who are the decision makers and what are their interested to, interests to make sure that the work I'm doing is going to resonate with that. So, um, and we were able to translate that um, uh, so that it was actionable at the end of that. And it wouldn't have been without that really important understanding right up front. Go ahead, Tom. Please, please. <laughs> I was just going to say, I heard Patty also ask about how we translate it back to the community. Is that part of the question too? Well, I, 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 this has been a, an area that we've just recently started. Uh, in re, I mean, we've been giving back as far as, you know, we give results cards back and we'll provide education around results, but now we're doing town halls on our research results. So this is a new area. So when Carrie says learning, we're doing a lot of learning here. Um, and so this is uh, actually spurred a whole nother line of research for us. Um, and that is uh, that research literacy piece. Um, so we've been talking a lot about like how we engage with our community, how they engage with us, but what is the understanding about their, what they know they're engaging with? Um, and what they've actually engaged with and what the results are. And we've just started to go down that path. So hopefully we'll get better at it. Um, but there's, we're finding also there's very little guidance out there. Uh, there's lots of guidance on how to do the community engaged participatory research part, how to recruit people, how to, you know, really engage with community, but actually giving the results back in a meaningful way that helps people gain the research literacy beyond the IRB and consent <laughs> that they do, meaning I engage in this research and it did this for me and I know what I actually engaged with. That's the piece that there seems to be less out there in um, and the effect that we have on our community. Like, are we actually making a difference? Um, and how do we measure that versus just the outcomes of our research? <laughs> like, are we shifting the needle? Because if we're doing community engaged research, it's one thing to have the engagement, I think we've all gotten actually pretty good at that. I mean, there's we're all saying about the same kind of processes that we're using. The other piece that I think is gonna be really hard for us is the work we're doing, is it really making an impact and how do we measure that impact? Um, and so those are the two things that I think we've been grappling with more recently uh, with our group. And I don't have any great answers, but I think we have to get there as community engaged researchers because our whole purpose of doing community engaged research is to move the needle in some way. So how do we do that? How do we help people really get research literacy, know what they're engaging in? And how do we test really, are we moving the needle? Right? Are we improving uh, outcomes on loneliness? Are we really reducing ER visit rates because we're engaging? Whatever that, whether the whole community outcome, not just our participants. Um, so anyway, that, that you can see I'm passionate about that because it's a new, it's been a new area of challenge for us um, and there's not a lot of guidance out there. So maybe another really great talk <laughs> uh, for, for this group. Um, it's if, because this is a community engaged, um, you know, a group of researchers. The question is then how do we measure our impact beyond just the engagement? Um, and I don't have an answer for that, but I would love for us to tackle that. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I think um, funders are increasingly getting interested in understanding what, uh, you know, how are we, how, how can you really measure the impact or what will be the impact of, of the grant on, uh, the, you know, the problem that you're studying. Uh, I guess the other thing that I also think about is um, how does my work inform policy? Um, I think, um, you know, it's, it's nice uh, to make change, but it, in that change, you know, be oriented towards only like impacts for people at a specified time. Uh, but I think it's another thing to think about how do we build policy, build structures where, you know, the impacts can be sustained through something that's beyond our, ourselves. And so um, that's something that I 
um, the lens in which I think about my work is like, how will it inform policy? There's a colleague at, uh, at UCSF who uh, I know she wrote into her R01 kind of like this policy piece where part of it is uh, sharing these policy briefs after to hopefully inform legislators, um, policymakers on, you know, what should be the actual changes made so that we can really uh, lead to lasting impact on these things. So I think that uh, increasingly being thoughtful about that. Um, I think also um, for me, if I'm honest with you, fear of mine is that one day the Senate is going to call me before them and, and grill me on, hey, we gave you these all this money. What did you do with it? Like they do. Um, I don't know if you all ever listened to these C-SPAN hearings, but people like they grill people. And I'm like, I feel like as a researcher who's federally funded, like we should be, we should feel accountable in the same way uh, to the resources that uh, we've been given. Because like I said before, these are tax dollars that are um, that are being uh, expensed to, to, uh, to fund these studies. So uh, I think keeping that in mind is so, so important. Thank you all. I love where this conversation went. And I wanted to um, add, Suda had asked in the chat, about the um, what about the role of community facing publications? So community education products that's not in a paid wall paywall journal. How do we get um, kind of more community facing publication and public scholarship? And that'll probably be our last question for. Yeah. Uh, I'll take that. I mean, we haven't started to get to that place other than um we are now doing a flyer on our research and the research results at our town halls that's relatively new i mean we're literally rolling that out right now um as we go around to each site and provide that information back and i think it's that process itself is a learning stage um you know our first one was held and it didn't feel like we really hit the mark and so we're going back to the drawing board and the flyer was changed and we're going to try it with our next town hall. So that's a, a micro level. I think, Ali, you were talking about like, you know, where can we get sort of bigger audiences? Um, you know, it's, we haven't, I don't know if Patty can think of that. We think we haven't gotten to that point where we've published. I mean, certainly, uh, I think Thomas mentioned, like, we'll have highlights about programs, uh, institutional highlights and things like that. They don't always reach the community. I will say I've been a part of some community based uh, web uh, education programs uh, that go out and we often tie in some of our work and our our things that we've learned about our research into those community facing web uh, uh, programs and sometimes are run through the school of pharmacy that I've participated in and anybody can log into those any anybody in the community. So that's another place, but I agree that I think that's probably a place and I think uh, maybe I'm going to say this not I mean all the details, but I think there's a few journals now that are using. Um, you know, uh, science students to review uh, big uh, uh, publications to and and having them bring the science down to a literacy that people can understand. Um, there's been a few big, I think, science magazine and a few other that are using um, uh, community um, reviewers as a way to say we don't understand your work. <laughs> We don't get your work. Your work is talking to other peers, but not talking to the community. And they're having them revise their work and send it back in. So there's more of that happening now uh, where we've been writing for each other for many, many years, um, and sometimes even discipline specific writing for each other. So I think there is more of a push even within the scientific community to make sure that our work um, it does speak to individuals, but um, it's been slow. So I agree, there's more to do. And I know we are getting very close to the end of our time. And I would just ask each of you if you have one last thing you'd like to say to close us out today. And then um, we can continue this conversation, I think, in uh, within our interest group as well. And we invite so, everyone to join the group who's not already part of it. <laughs> so I'm going to say, because I was the last one to speak on that, I'm going to yield my time to the other two panelists okay. so that we have time for <laughs> questions. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll just be quick. I I, I think um, I, I heard a talk from uh, the lawyer and author Brian Stevenson, uh, who wrote this book called Just Mercy. Um, yeah. uh, he talks about get, getting proximal, and I would say that uh, like 
if you're, we're trying to, uh, we need to work, you know, work, we have to work with people, not for them. And so I think by really immersing ourselves and getting proximal, that's key uh, to this work. And so um, that's what I would say would be a pearl. Um, yeah. For you, you all. Thank you. And Carrie? Yeah, I would just um, encourage anyone that is thinking about doing this work to search within their university for resources that exist, including um, government relations. There are a lot of untapped resources, and I have a lot of conversations with people like, oh, I didn't think about starting in, in my own home first. And and other people are doing this work that have partnerships. And it's just, this is team science. This is not you and you are not alone. And there are a lot of other people probably feeling your pain and and just um, seek, you know, within your own university first um, for support networks, um, connections. It's been really, really helpful and important in my own journey. Thank you. Thank you all so much for those um, kind of uh, just tips of grounding ourselves in all of this work. Um, I encourage everybody to take a look at all the resources that have been posted in the chat today. We'll be um, including those with the recording uh, so that you'll have, have access to them. And also reaching out to your universities. Office of Research and all those places to find resources that are available and also to connect with other community engaged scholars at your institution. I found that to be um, a helpful way. And of course, become part of our GSA community engaged research interest group where you can continue to build this network. And we did have that um, in the chat, the way to join an interest group. Uh, you can find it on the website. And um, Lastly, just please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for their it was generous generosity of time, experience, perspectives with us today. And uh, thank you, Allie, for jumping in when my technology didn't work at the beginning, especially, but for being such a wonderful moderator. And I'd also like to uh, thank all the participants today. You shared wonderful information that we can all learn from, and I hope that this will continue. And we want to thank Jason Baker and Gina Schoen at GSA who helped us with all the behind the scenes part and will make this more widely available to the GSA community. So thank you everyone and um, look forward to seeing you at the next uh, interest group activities. Thank you all so much. June 28th. Hope you can join us. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, Penny. Appreciate yeah. it.